My name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. It's uh, a pleasure to be spending what is it today in New York, a beautiful Friday after a deluge yesterday. I thought we were going to drown. Um, we are continuing to read Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition. Um, really one of the, <laughs> you have to imagine, one of the great books ever written. Um, and uh, I hope um, the group is, this group and the reading together exercise is, is helping you to, to appreciate that and see that. Um, the book uh, is broken into uh, six chapters. Each chapter is in sections. We are in, in the midst of, of chapter four uh, on work, one of the um, uh, fundamental um, capacities of, of, of the human condition, right? Not human nature, but um, what it means to be human as we have uh, been born into a world and conditioned by it. And on the one hand, we humans have to labor, uh, we have to live. Uh, on the other hand, we have to work. Why do we have to work? Well, um, you know, in this chapter, uh, we have gotten the answer to that. Why is it important for humans to work? Um, uh, and there's, in a sense, uh, two answers to that uh, in RN's work, in RN's writing, uh, which is a work. Um, there's sort of the, uh, the, the, the sort of traditional answer um, that we work uh, to produce uh, useful things. So on the one hand, um, Homo Faber, uh, the one who works, uh, <laughs> produces tools. Um, and those tools help us to live better. And thus they ease the, the pain of the animal laborans, the, 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 the man insofar as we are a laboring animal who seeks to live. Um, uh, but there's another non-utilitarian uh, uh, um, um, point uh, of, of working, of homo faber, and that is uh, to build a home for mortals, uh, to build a home in which mortals um, are, have a stable and meaningful life and existence. Um, and that is uh, the, that is for our end, uh, I, I don't know if I want to put it this way, but I'll, for now I will, uh, that is the higher um, uh, uh, point of, of, of work. Uh, in a sense, the argument in, in this chapter is that a work uh, can be is often reduced to and is seen by most thinkers of work as a uh, utilitarian, right? And, and she will say that uh, homo faber is marked by uh, an incapacity to judge between utility and meaningfulness. Um, that it is that homo faber is reduced or reduces uh, all work to usefulness and utility and instrumentality. Um, and yet uh, what she's going to argue, and especially in these last two chapters, um, is that there is an aspect of work that exceeds um, that instrumentality. Um, in fact, she's gonna say on page 172 to 173 near the very end of the whole chapter on work in the last chapter on the permanence of the world and the work of art, that um, that beyond utility, all work. Oh, I just messed up on something. I'm sorry. Um, trying to let people in. Um, all all work, insofar as it. Um, sorry, could everyone uh, mute? Could everyone produces mute? things that have an appearance, whether they're beautiful or ugly. Um, or something in between, as she says at the very top of, of 173, all work insofar as it appears um, uh, has a kind of 
um, shine to it. It shines in the world. And insofar as work shines, it stands between us and begins to provide for us a home. And thus it has a meaning beyond its mere functionality or, or usefulness. Um, and so uh, in, in doing that, all work uh, contributes to the durability of the world and the immortality of the world. And thus the meaningfulness of the world as opposed to its mere usefulness or its uh, ability to simply keep us alive. Um, of work, of works, of things that um, are, uh, are made, uh, most of them though are generally understood by us uh, on the level of functionality and usefulness. Um, whether they're as tools that help us with, with, with labor or as products of um, production, um, even trinkets uh, or, 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 or whatever it is, we, we generally think that they have their end in the object, which we will buy and sell and exchange on a market, and their value is therefore relative. Um, they are reduced. We don't actually, you know, when we, when we produce a pen, um, even a fine pen, even a, you know, a, a nice fountain pen, uh, whether it's mass produced or whether it's handmade, generally we care more about its usefulness than we do about its shining appearance in the world. And we will use it, even a nice pen we will use, right? Or, you know, I have a nice first edition of the human condition. And even that I use and I write in whether I should or not. Uh, you can all blame me if you're one of those book lovers who thinks that books should be preserved as, you know, art objects and not used. Well, you know, I, I've had that phase in my life, but for me, the book is to be used. Um, and so even though this is a hardcover book that I hope will last and has a certain beauty to it um, and is a work that shines in the world, uh, eventually it will fall apart, it will decompose, it will, you know, and, and, and it will go away. And so um, its functionality overshadows its, its, its meaningfulness and its contribution to the durability and immortality of the world. Um, the one uh, kind of work objects um, that uh, most shine forth and most contribute to the durability and immortality and meaningfulness of the world are works of art. Um, insofar as they are not supposed to be useful, they're not supposed to be um, bought and sold. Uh, and to the extent they become part of the art market, as Arendt says, their price is arbitrary, right? There's there's no, uh, I mean, I think that we have it's an interesting point for question. I mean, aren't all prices arbitrary to some extent? And, and one would have to imagine, yes, although there's a supply and demand, but that's true on the art market as well. But what she wants to say is we don't buy and sell art uh, because of some use. Uh, it's not useful. Um, and to the extent we buy it and sell it to cover a hole or to pass our time or to show ourselves not to be Philistines, um, we reduce art to a commodity that we buy and sell and it becomes less about art and more about um, a, a thing of, of use value without, um, that doesn't contribute to the durability of the world. Um, uh, so, so art is this one um, activity uh, of, the, of the homo faber, the worker, that um, uh, does uh, contribute to durability. And, um, Above all, uh, what it can do is it can, um, well, it can do two things. It can reify into the world thought. So, um, and we'll have to, we'll talk about this more, I'm sure, in the Q&A. Um, but Arendt makes a distinction between thought, cognition, and logic or rationality. And what she argues is that the source of art is not cognition. Um, not like a scientific understanding that has some end and not rationality, some intelligence, but is a thought. What is thought? Well, uh, that's, a, that's an important question in these pages. 
Um, uh, but it is um, something along the lines of um, there's no end to it. It's useless. Uh, and it is um, what gives life meaning. Um, it is what inspires uh, the artist to take that thought that they have and put it into uh, the world. Um, so what is thought? Uh, it's an excellent question. It is um, some insight or idea that an artist or a person has, and this is an important point that I think a lot of artists will contest, um, and, uh, and, and I think is one of the core insights of Arendt's work that I'm sure will be interesting and controversial for many of you. The artist thinks in private, right? Um, she says on, on page 161 that uh, the privacy um, which the early modern age demanded as a supreme right of each member was actually the guarantee of isolation without which no work can be produced. She's arguing here that you need to be alone, uh, in solitude. She uses the word isolation here. Um, I don't think she's using isolation here in the sense that she's using it at the end of the origins of totalitarianism. I think she's using it here in a, in a non-technical sense of being alone in the sense of being solitary. Um, it is only if you are alone uh, and not with others, she says, that you can have a thought um, that you can then put into the world as a work of art or even as a work of workmanship. Um, why is that? Uh, because to be uh, alone uh, protects you from the uh, socialization of thinking, um, namely that you become conformist and you think what everyone else thinks. Because if you are thinking what everyone else thinks, your idea is not mass, you, your idea is not um, something that will uh, be original and, and shine forth. And so the artist, she says, needs a certain um, privacy and isolation. Um, uh, which again, I've, I've, I've given, I've talked to a number of art schools about RN's thinking on art. And I find that, um, they really, really resist this, this point of hers. And I'm not saying they're right or they're wrong. Um, I just, I have found it to be quite a, a controversial, uh, point of hers. Um, as a result, she says, art cannot be done as in teamwork, right? Um, this is on the bottom of 161. Um, and uh, I don't think that means you can't eventually work with a team, but you have to have the inspiration, she seems to think, um, as, as a kind of um, alone in, in, in thought. Um, so so there, these two chapters that we're reading today, one on uh, the exchange market and, and one on the permanence of the world of the art, just, just briefly, the exchange market, uh, the point of this chapter uh, is really uh, to continue the discussion of that she begins in the previous chapter uh, about um, what is the um, uh, what is the measure, right? What is the measure of man, right? And so in the in the previous chapter on on uh, instrumentality, what she says is, you know, Protagoras said the measure of man man is the measure of all things. Plato says, no, the God is, can only be the measure of, of all things. And RN says that in, in the exchange market, which is the way that we have, which is the public world of the modern world of homo faber, of workmanship, um, there are no absolute values. Um, everything uh, is reduced to simply um, a value given by money. There's no intrinsic worth uh, to things. All things dissolve into their value of, and thus into relativity. Um, and in that devaluation, um, Homo Faber loses the measure of himself and all things. There's no measure left. Um, she then turns to art and the permanence of the world because the 
for two reasons, right? One, because there's going to be some work that actually seeks to create not value, but meaning that is lasting and thus not relative. And that's going to be the work of art. And so the argument is that the work of art um, actually aims to create a home, something that it holds us together by creating works that last and are stable and shine. Um, and in doing so, uh, provide a stable and a lasting home on earth, one that is not relative. Um, and then in the transition to the next chapter on action, she's going to say that um, not only does Homo Faber in the work of art create a home and thus as Homo Faber um, take their thoughts and reify them into things um, and in reifying them into things, build a home. Um, they also, Homo Faber has another important role, which is that an artist, the Homo Faber, begins to appropriate, be, begins to not be simply a worker, but also becomes an actor. And they become an actor insofar as they tell, as they reify, they thingify, they turn an action of others, which is fleeting and will disappear, a speech or a rebellion or a protest or a march. Um, and they turn that into a work of art. They tell a story, they make a poem, they make, uh, they make a performance. And in doing so, um, they become actors. And she's going to say, well, what's the measure, right? How do we measure act actors? How do we measure artists? How do we measure a work? And, and the problem is that on the exchange market, right, there's no measure, it's all relative. And she's going to answer um, in, in the chapter on action, um, well, which is probably the most controversial aspect of this whole book. Um, she's going to argue that the only measure for action is greatness, right? Whether it um, uh, is and deserves to be immortalized. Um, and so the artist, insofar as they create things that then become part of the world and impact the world, they actually bleed into and become actors to be measured by the criteria of, of greatness. Um, but we'll get to that uh, later as we talk about the chapter on action. Um, so that's the overarching, um, uh, 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 I think, approach to these two sections of chapter four on work. And the only thing I'd like to point out uh, and highlight is the discussion on page 168 to 169 of, um, um, of reification. Uh, which I think needs a little bit of, of explanation. Um, the, the argument that she's making here is that uh, works of art defy equalization, right? First point. They are, um, they're not, uh, you know, they're not all the same. There are great artists and less great artists. Um, and, and there's no, in her mind, there's no getting around that. Um, uh, second, uh, the work of art uh, seeks the immortality of the world that is built by human hands. It seeks to build, it seeks to contribute to and does contribute to a lasting and durable human world. Three, that the source of art uh, is in the capacity of thought. Uh, and that um, thinking, uh, which has no end and is not a feeling, um, transforms, um, it's, is able to be transformed from its enclosed dumbness, uh, its muteness. I, I'm, I'm actually using here some of the German, the language in the German edition, because I think it's a little more clear, of, of mere feelings. Um, and it's able to transform those feelings 
until they fit into a world that we, because they are ready to be directed to objects and to experience their fulfillment and limit in the thingly condition of the world. Um, this word thingly condition of the world, this word of reification of how we thingify. Uh, in German, she calls it the vergegenständlichende Verdinglichung, the, the turning into a thing um, by the fulfillment of its thingness. I mean, you know, it's, a, it's something you can only say in German. Um, uh, and, 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 and this turning into a thing by the fulfillment of its thingness, um, she says, is exemplified by um, uh, Rana Maria Rilke's poem, Magi, or Magic. Um, and uh, in that poem, uh, Magic, uh, which she gives you here in the German, right? Um, Aus unbeschreiblicher Verwandlung stammen solche Gebilde, Fuhl und Glaub, wir leiden oft, zu Asche werden Flammen, doch in der Kunst der Flamme wird der Staub. Um, and then the next line is, here is magic. In English, you know, I'm not going to do any good job on this, but from indescribable transformation originate amazing shapes, feel, trust. We suffer often. To ashes turn our flames. Yet art can set on fire the dust. So what is this turning into a thing by the fulfillment of its thingliness? It is magic by which art sets dust on fire. Art takes the, the material world, whether it's clay or words or, 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 or paint or, or, or the human body, and it takes this dust and sets it afire. It, and it does so through thought, through the, for, for the, through the reification of thought into the thing. Um, and, and in doing so, um, the ordinary is raised up and elevated into a realm of enchantment. Um, and in doing so, that ordinary becomes part of a, a durable, lasting world. We, it, we, we, we are drawn to it. And, uh, and that for Arendt is um, uh, what the work of art is. And thus work is not simply for her uh, 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 on the level of, of, of usefulness and instrumentality, but has this other, other, other side. Um, one just side note, uh, it's, I don't think it's that important, but it's, it's worth um, pointing out, Arendt, always boasts of knowing the entirety of, of, of German poetry by heart. Um, uh, and obviously that's a bit of an excessive, but she does know a lot. But uh, this particular Rilke poem, uh, which she may have known already, was sent to her in 1951 by um, Martin Heidegger. Uh, so um, I simply uh, point that out. Um, I, I think there's a uh, a fair bit of uh, a strong connection between Heidegger's thinking in the art and the work of art and, and Arendt's um, thinking on art here. All right, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, this is a very rich and exciting two chapters. I barely touched on most things I really wanted to, but uh, now is the time for, for people to, to ask questions and begin a conversation. So the two ways to ask questions, just so everybody remembers, are to raise your hand, that's the best way. And I'll call on you, please try and uh, you know, ask a question, make a comment. And then um, you can also talk in the chat with each other. And if there's a, a good question in the chat, uh, please let me know about it and I'll try and, and alert myself to it. So the first question is Bill, Bill T. Jones. Unmute yourself hey, when you're asking a question and then, uh, and then ask away. Hello. Um, I Bill, you got on I mute. Bill, you got on mute. I am unmuted, aren't I? I'm according to me. Well, I'm am I? Hold on, I don't yeah. hear you. Is other people... I, I, oh, there you I, are. I, I, I got you now. I'm sorry. It was my fault. Uh, you realize, of course, I don't type, 
So I don't chat like <laughs> with my fingers. So that's why I get rude and I jump into conversation, okay? But, um, I, and I want to just uh, take a little bit, a moment here to say, I, once again, I wish Anna Hennerart was alive because um, I wish that she could be privy to the conversations that have been going on at least the last 50 years around art. Um, the first thing I would start with, I believe I understand now what conceptual artists were getting at, and I think they were pushing against Hannah Arendt. Um, so how dare someone actually actually write down an instruction on a piece of paper, uh, which is nothing more than an idea and declare it a work of art. But that's one thing I would, I would challenge. And there's something that is uh, this objecthood, which uh, betrays a certain kind of bias, I think, uh, informed by something very European and very, I dare say, 19th century. The idea that uh, uh, labor is something that never ends, work with this instrumentality has an objective, an object is made. And then I'm thinking of all the things like, what is an improvisational set? What is a conceptual object? What is a conceptual art? What was John Cage doing in his notion of indeterminacy? Indeterminacy is just uh, flipping coins to determine order and something could be different every time. Uh, these, uh, this idea of made complete is, uh, has been a hallmark of a lot of the adv most advanced art of the last 50, 60, almost 100 years, taking issue with all those ideas of, of um, of, of permanence. And um, there is this ocean, this notion, which is, uh, I mean, I, maybe I'm not owning up to this. I'm a working artist. Immortality. Immortality. So I wonder if an art would actually be of a class of people who would place, uh, what is it? We, I'm sure everybody in this, this knows the drill that isn't architecture considered the highest? And then there, it, and then there's music, and then there's painting, and usually things like, uh, like dance doesn't even get on the list. But uh, I'm going to give her a pass, assuming that she would equate dancing with quote someone writing a melody, right? Is that so? And the public and the private. Uh, I don't know if she's ever uh, hung out with people who. Uh, well, how can I say it? You know, if you, you go to places right now where young people throw down and they improvise and they dance for each other with each other. Is that not art? She probably doesn't. She just said, well, you have to admit this, uh, there's great art, not such great art. And I'm going to really nail you on that, Ro Roger, maybe make you come out. Do you believe that uh, some art that's, that anyone can get out there and throw down and have a great moment is less than Shakespeare? Okay, we, uh, we can fight about that. I don't think I have the feeling for it. And then there's this idea of thought and feeling. You keep saying thought. What about art that comes? I, I personally believe that art originates as a feeling and then it has a fine thought. So I just threw out a lot of stuff here, but dealing with Joseph Boys and the, his refusal, his acknowledging, uh, rebelling against the idea of the object. He thought there was a cult of objecthood that led to marketing and so on. He wanted to encourage a whole generation of thought that had not to do with object and improvisation, indeterminate processes, conceptual art, um, I get, all yeah. those things, all those things. And let me finish by saying, uh, one of, I always wondered where Oscar Wilde came up with this idea uh, all that mankind creates that is useless is art. And now I think he, it, uh, well, she might, have, maybe she loved him or did he love her? But the time <laughs> is, uh, so those are my, uh, they're my comments. Um, great thinker. But as I said before, a few weeks ago when I was having a meltdown, <laughs> I, one of my problems with Hannah Arendt is that she didn't live long enough to be, to have the nutrition that I personally, as a contemporary person, need. And this is not about politics right now. It's not about race. There's something about the way we have been thinking now about art making and art's relationship to uh, civilization, this object. Uh, there it is. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Yeah. Bill, I, you know, thank you. Let me, let me say, first of all, it's a, everything you say is 
incredibly powerful and apt. And it is, when I say I've given this talk, or not this talk, I've given talks on her and art, and, you know, it is not well received. Um, and, um, and I think for a lot of the ways you very eloquently put it, um, and you want to put me on the spot and say, well, do I agree with Hannah Arendt or not? Um, you know, <laughs> let me put that aside for a moment and say that my general view on this is to try to understand Hannah Arendt, uh, which is harder than I think it seems. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I won't, I won't escape your question. I'll come to it maybe at the end. Um, but so conceptual art, um, improvisational sets, John Cage, you know, I love John Cage. We have the John Cage archive at Bard. I, 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 I performed John Cage. I love it. Um, what does Arendt think of it? And would she change her opinion today? Um, so a few things. She, she thinks of art through the idea of, of cultivation, of culture. This is in another essay of hers called um, The Crisis in Culture. And um, uh, culture, you know, we, we cultivate a field. We, we you know, we, we farm it. And over time, we make it into a field. Um, and what she, so she has this very strong sense that art um, is about um, cultivating and building something, a world uh, that is meaningful. Now, um, there are uh, other ways to be meaningful, right? Um, action can be meaningful. And as, you, as we will see, action for her is the highest level of the vita activa, right? In her, in her telling. But action doesn't last. And it is, it disappears unless an artist preserves it um, or someone preserves it, a, a monument builder or an artist or, or, a, or a historiographer or somebody. So all of which is to say that for Arendt, the kind of things you're talking about, conceptual art, improvisational sets, um, free verse, would be what she would call actions. Um, and as actions, very powerful, very meaningful. There's not a, this is not a derogatory claim about free verse or about, um, or about conceptual art. It's, it's what it says is it's doing something differently than um, cultivating a world. It's intervening, it's acting, it's disrupting, it's, um, uh, putting actions and thoughts and, and, and actions and, 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 and speeches into the world in ways that make people stop and say, oh, what's going on? And then when those actions are great or meaningful or important, other people come along and talk about them or memorialize them or create art about them. And that's a different activity. That's what she calls work because it's building a world. So what I guess what I'd like to say is, the fact that she excludes some things you're talking about from art doesn't mean she has a negative or derogatory view of them. It means she thinks that they're part of action. Um, and, uh, and I think that's a helpful uh, insight. Now- it's very, it's very slick what you just did, Roger. You just said, <laughs> you guys are really good. We love what you do, but you ain't in this group. No, you're, so you're, that not, was you're, just you're not in the group with Shakespeare. You're not in there with Beethoven. You're not in there with the real. Someone well, just wrote in the chat. I was about to. You, 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 you didn't, you didn't let me finish. It. You yeah, didn't let me people. finish. Yeah. You didn't let me finish because what I was about to say is, Arendt's decision to say this is an art, right, is to me, um, you know, not very meaningful, and I don't, uh, you know, I've. I've, I, you know, there was a time in my life, I mean, you know, I, I actually have this very strong memory, one of, uh, I don't know how many of you know the writer and essayist, um, Wyatt Mason, I know Bill knows him, because Wyatt and Bill have collaborated on some things. Mm -hmm. um, but 
when I, the first time I ever met Wyatt Mason, we had a long walk in Central Park and we debated whether um, free verse and certain things were art. That was our first conversation we ever had. And I was of the, I was under the influence of Heidegger at this time. And um, I was not yet really someone who read a lot of Arendt. And I was taking the position that art needed to be worldly and, and needed to have these things and, and, and why it was just aghast. And, and, and I have come to no longer hold that opinion. I, 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 I now, um, I think, you know, I, I think John Cage is art. I think free verse is art. Um, uh, and, 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 and I don't think, you know, in many ways, I don't think so much importance should be put on those labels. What, what Arendt is doing is not trying to um, uh, be a, an art critic and, and tell us this is art and this is not. I think she's trying to um, talk about um, the way certain activities of the human condition are meaningful in the world. And I think now what we've done, we see is that more and more art seeks its meaning, not through creating objects that have durability, but by engaging in performances and actions that um, disrupt and interrupt and uh, seek to uh, uh, interrupt conformities and, and, and ways of being that, are, that have been stale. And in doing so, um, more and more artists do what she calls action. Um, now, there are advantages to that, right? But I think Arendt is also helpful in that she reminds us of what's lost. And what's lost is that we increasingly don't have works that are durable in our world and our world becomes less and less a home and a stable world. And we see our world losing that kind of stability. And that for Arendt is important because she thinks humans can't actually exist without such a world. And if we, if we turn art into performance and, and action, that's great because it actually leads to new performance and action. And that's important. She, she thinks action is essentially important for humanity. But if we don't have a group of people who are doing objects that last, there's something lost. So, so to me, I'm not in the business, and I don't think Arendt would be in the business of policing who is an artist, what is art, whatever. It's about making us think about how our change in the nature of how we do art leads to an increasingly unhomely world. And, and that's, I think, a valuable lesson. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Mara, you're up next. Um, here I am. Um, so, wow, I have a lot of comments. I mean, to, to, to Bill's point, and I am in, 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 in no stature, you know, to, to measure up to, to his comments. But one point I wanted to make about this is that uh, the issue of the production of the art object, whatever that is, and the reception. And I think that Arendt is talking about, I put it in the chat, you know, from the point of view of the production, but she herself, if I may say it, is taking the work of art as a receiver. So I don't know whether these two are conflated in how she thinks about work of art. And this is why probably she's prioritizing thought as opposed to, to feeling that is very, very conspicuous, right? Um, like erasing feeling from a work of art, I can't really relate to it. So, but the other points I wanted to make um, moving a little bit away from art, which is not, not my expertise, unfortunately. I mean, it's the idea of thought that you discussed at the very beginning. Um, and, and it really passed me because it's, I mean, the idea of thought is very puzzling in Aaron, particularly because here she explicitly at the beginning excludes her from this book, but then she brings it you know, back in 
not as a dimension of the vita activa and the human condition, but explicitly as a capacity together with bartering and use. And if we think in those terms, you know, capacities would correspond to each of the uh, conditions of the vita activa that is used to labor, bartering to work, and thought we would think to action. And, and yet thought, even if two in one is done, you know, in isolation and action is together with, um, together with others. So I don't know, I mean, the status of thought, I mean, she's not a systematic thinker, we, we know that, but, is, but it's ambiguous to say, to say the least, because thought in its open-endedness, as she puts it, you know, for, for, for you know, for, for creating kind of um, object is, is analogous to action. So, so that's one point. And together with that, you know, the priority of the mind over feelings, if I may say, is the overarching kind of theme of what I'm saying, is that art, the idea of what right, an right, idea right, is. is, that, is are you in a wind tunnel or is that somebody else who's, who's making that noise? No, it's, it's, it's me. It's me. I, I, there was a, the, I'm outside and there was like uh, a wind in the Bay Area. Uh, so I'm, I'm covered now. Uh, so, Sorry about that. So, so the other thing is, what is an idea, you know, for Aaron? Because here the idea has a very, very positive meaning because it what translates uh, or crystallizes, right, in a work of art. I mean, there's art because there was before an idea. Yeah. But idea is also. Um, but idea is also the origin, you know, of ideology <laughs> of the, yes, because I mean, she takes ideology as the logic of an idea. So it's wow. very interesting. I mean, I just thought about this, this very kind of double edged sword of, of her notion of an idea. Right. So I'm putting it yeah. um, right there. And I only wanted to suggest, you know, the issue of poetry again, you know, the dualities of, 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 of Arendt and is that, you know, poetry is done in isolation, right? Because it's a work of art that memorializes, you know, the futility or the ephemeral character of action. But at the same time, to give meaning to an action, you need others. Yeah. Um, so again, the idea of poetry kind of straddles between you know, two dimensions, and, and I want to just recommend, I'm sure everyone read it, but uh, the book Oliver Sacks, Music Musicophilia, um, where he says why poetry memorializes and music, because they stay in a different part of the brain. But this is neuroscience, and I just toss it out there because it's a fun fact, as they put it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mara, it's great. Um, so there's two parts to your question, or three maybe, and, and they're both interesting. You know, you said, you asked about the receiver, and this relates to what I was just talking about also with Bill, so it's really worth reminding ourselves and pushing on it. Um, uh, you know, Arendt says in the essay, um, What is Freedom?, that the closest form of art to action is performance. And she says the reason is because it has a spectator and it's for others and it has for a receiver. And, you know, and, and so, um, it, you know, so to the extent that the artwork is created and performed for others, um, for her, it's closer to action um, than it is to reification. I'm not going to use the word art. I'm going to use the word reification and action um and um so poetry you said you know to the extent that it is um created in isolation it is um you know a, a thing of thought to the extent it's reified 
and put into um, rhyme uh, so that it can be remembered, it becomes re a reification. But to the extent it's performed for others, uh, it becomes more like action. Again, these are just, I think, I hope, prods to us thinking about the human condition, not about trying to say, oh, it's good or bad. Um, on, the, on the question of feeling and thought, um, this, is, this is something that goes throughout Arendt's work. And um, you know, I, I believe it comes from um, a, a simple, a fairly simple uh, belief on her part, thought, which is that um, uh, there's a difference between thinking from the perspective of another and trying to feel another's pain. Um, the second is what we would call compassion. Um, trying to feel another's pain. And RN thinks, A, as we've already talked about, you can't feel another's pain. Um, and B, um, she just doesn't, she, 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 she doesn't think trying to feel what another feels um, is, 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 is a meaningful um, uh, a, a way of expanding our uh, our, 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 our perspective. But she thinks that thinking from the perspective of another, trying to understand the meaningfulness of the world from the other's perspective, that's what she um, thinks thinking is. And, 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 and she believes that that is what's required of us um, to widen our perspective on others. And so this focus on thinking versus feeling, you know, as she says on 168, she says, you know, feeling is trapped in ourselves. Um, it's not worldly. What is thinking, even though it's useless and even though it's inside of ourselves, thinking for her has a capacity to escape ourselves and think from the perspective of the other that she doesn't think feeling does. You know, again, I'm not going to go to the mat on this. <laughs> um, it's, it's, you know, I, I don't, in the end, we can call call it think feeling, and you know, as long as we try and understand her point, which is that we should be expanding our perspective by thinking about many perspectives in the world and trying to broaden our particular perspective by the world, rather than simply trying to feel some sort of amorphous feeling. Um, as long as we understand that. That's what matters, not whether you sort of hold on to this strict distinction between feeling and thinking. That's what I say. It's not what Aaron says. Um, but, uh, you know, um, I would, uh, that's how I would understand that. On the question of ideology, I, you know, yes, ideology comes from idea, but remember, it's a perversion of an idea. It's a pseudoscientific perversion of ideas. So I, we just have to keep that in mind. Um, Roger, yes. what about, what about can, catharsis? What about catharsis? catharsis? Oh. Uh, wait, Roger, can I say something about the idea? Sorry, Bill. Yeah, that, I that, have yes, also about I, I don't know. Okay, idea is a perversion, but given the fact that she's very careful about the way she uses words and concepts, it it allows for for perplexity. Let's put it this way, and that's all I'm gonna say. Sorry. Okay. Um, catharsis. Um, I'm not sure I have a, I'm not sure I have much, I have an answer. I have a, I'm not sure, Bill. Um, is there a reason you asked that? I'm just, is it, you're talking about the combination of thinking and feeling? Is that where you're coming from? Yes, that's exactly it. Yes, yes. <sighs> Hey, 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 Roger, it's Susan Wright. Can I just, on that subject, I think that's a really interesting thought because I am not a dancer. <laughs> but writing, in writing, you know, there's a difference between this and, uh, and forget me, but all of the great 
the other writers that are recognized, whether it's Wolf or Mary McCarthy, you know, they all have their diaries. They all have their letters to each other, yeah, to people they've written to. And, when, and I do a lot of that because it gives me an insight into who they were as people. And the reason why I say that is because in their published writings, there's a thought that comes through that overlays their raw feelings that gets expressed, I find, in say their, let, their personal letters or their writings to other people. And now, and, and again, I'm talking from writing and not dance, which is a very, to me, as I witness it, a physical energy. But writing's kind of different to me in that. So I wonder if very much of what Arendt says is somehow dependent upon that artistic expression. So as a writer, I get her, this is all I want to say, it's a comment. I get her relationship between the emotional raw feeling of something, the expression of that versus what gets revised and written over, not downplayed, but it is a different process than, than, than witnessing the writing of their diaries to friends, et cetera. I, I, I don't know if I'm expressing this correctly, but I, there's something in that that I do understand from the writing perspective. I think that's a very fair point. And, um, you know, I think RN is maybe inconsistent on that to some degree. I mean, she'll often say, you know, don't look at people's private lives, look at their what they've written and their public lives, but actually she'll often cite people's letters. Um, so there's a certain inconsistency in there maybe. I'm still thinking about the catharsis question, and I think you're that's helpful, Susan. Yes, yes. If yes, other yes. people, if other people want to uh, jump in on this, I could use help. And 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 just let me just interrupt a minute again. The, I, I'm sorry, I lost that point. Right, the catharsis point is about often I see this catharsis in these personal writings. Yeah, I got and yet that. When you right, okay, okay, just well, no, I, 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 took, about I took your point to be directly uh, to the question. Understood. I, and I okay. think it's good. I'm just still. And, and, I, and I'm fascinated in a physical sense, because as a physical person, even though I don't know crap about dancing, I get this physical release, this catharsis. Yeah. So yes, but it's not art. It's just catharsis. So interesting discussion. Does anyone want to jump in on this? or? or yeah, anybody? I do. OK, who said that? And jump James Kyber. So, oh, hi, James. Yep. Um, Thank you, Bill, for, for your observations and your questions. And thank you, Roger, for even considering this. My problem with Hannah Arendt, I realize after today's reading, is I'm always sitting there going, yes, true, right, logical, but it doesn't make sense. I believe in an art that brings us to our senses. It is through our senses that we come to experience, through our experience that we come to thought, through our thought that we come to knowledge. If that knowledge withstands the test of our senses, it comes to a wisdom that spurs a culture to a greater purpose than self-celebration. The catharsis is when the senses are brought forward to the point that we understand and link with each other. That's what making art is about for me. And as far as valuing it, mine is $85 a square inch and $4,000 a day. That's the valuation. My NFTs are going to explode. I'd like to get back to Zadie Smith, who basically says we are breeding a culture of writers and not a culture of readers. And consequently, we, we are losing our stories. And as we are losing our stories, we are losing our humanities. I'm having catharsis right now. Thank you, James. Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, the Zadie Smith point is excellent. You know, she gave that, that essay was originally given as a talk at the RN Center at our conference, uh, one of our conferences. And it was a brilliant lecture and the essay is brilliant. And, um, you know, I think it captures something deep about our culture, which is that 
you know, she, she, the way she presented it in the lecture and the essay is she goes and gives readings and no one asks questions about what she's reading. They ask questions about how she get, how they can become a writer. And um, everyone, you know, and, and the idea is that even the best writers today, you know, only speak to very small audiences. And, and she says, this is Amy Smith, and there's not sort of a, a general story. Um, and there's not sort of a, 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 a cultural art. Everyone speaks to ever smaller and smaller subgroups. Um, and everyone wants to be a writer to speak to their smaller subgroups. I don't think there's, I don't know if there's a way around that, um, but I think it's true. And uh, I think it's part of what RN calls the loss of the humanities um, insofar as the humanities have become ever broken up smaller. Uh, and we don't tell a humanist story, whether it's a nationalist humanist story or a globalist humanist story. Um, we need to teach the training of the senses. We need to train our senses so that we we get a sense of each other. Right. So I, I, I happen to agree with you. And, you know, I, I, this is actually something I'm deeply committed to and working on. I'm I'm involved with about 30 people right now who are, we're going to be meeting this summer. And we're trying to launch a new PhD in the global humanities, which would be about bringing the humanities back to telling global stories about what it means to be human without national borders, but um, not specialized knowledge, trying to tell general stories, sensual stories about the human condition. Um, uh, and I think the humanities have become overly specialized and overly and lost that 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 storytelling ability about what it means to be human uh what you're saying about the senses and what you and bill and susan are saying about catharsis i think is right and i don't think it's a counter to rn's thinking that's what i'm sort of trying to struggle with i mean i think everything you guys are saying i think is is is, is what i understand rn to be saying um you know uh i i'm you know whether the language of feeling and thought is unhelpful and it may be, um, uh, is where I'm sort of struggling. Um, yeah, but Roger, you put you put things, and this is what I love about working with you on the Hannah Arendt, is you try to make sense of what she's saying. Physical sense, senses sense. Whereas I, I find myself thinking, thinking I'm understanding, thinking it's right, thinking it's true, thinking it's logical, but it doesn't make sense. And then all of a sudden you make sense. Training the senses, training movement, changing repetitive sound and movement, moving moving through space. These, are, this is sense, kinesthet, kinesthetic sense. And our culture needs it. I was approached in front of the Hotel Pierre one, one night by a former head of the Lila Wallace Foundation and the Massachusetts Council on the Arts. She said, James, I've known the programs you've run in communities of color. I want to talk to you about what I should do with this grant for 14 million bucks to improve art making in America. And I said, it's funny, I was just at, at a gallery last night and I was talking to, to the owner and he's saying, you know, and we were saying how in the 20s and the 30s, it cost people to make art. It cost them their life. It, it was expensive. It was difficult. There wasn't a, a populace. Now we're in, a, in, a, in an environment where people get an education. They think they're entitled to make art. And I said to her, she said, so what would you do? I know you've run the pro these all these programs in these communities. What would you do? And I said, honestly, I'd make art making illegal. Then we'd get some good shit. We'd get something worth looking at. We wouldn't get thousands and thousands of stories of everybody's points of view we need to build our culture back we need catharsis we need to connect intimately and profoundly through the senses yes it's the senses and get beyond this self-celebration that we're we're all amused by we're amusing ourselves to death it's it's life and death it's life and death. We're drowning in the pus of racism. We need stories about that. We're starting to get a story about that that we can we'll be able to stand on. Catharsis. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll shut up and move on. Oh, look, I think it's great. 
I, I really do. And, you know, and I think there's, I think what you're saying is, you know, I mean, like you, you I'll, I'll you know, I, 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 it's hard for, it's, hard, it's easier for me to talk about what I know. And, and I apologize for that, but you know, you say that I, I try and make sense of Hannah Arendt. Um, and that's because I insist that she is doing what she says she's doing, which is talking common sense, right? Common sense. And, you know, and so I insist that I can understand her and that she makes sense. And it strikes me that, you know, that activity, you know, has to transcend thinking and feeling and other things. And um, I think that's what you're talking about. We have to demand that things actually make sense, that they that they not be stupid, elite, whatever, and that they not be full of jargon, but that they're actually saying something meaningful. And if you read someone like Hannah Arendt and you think it's unmeaningful, either you could say she's wrong or you could say, I'm not reading her the way she meant to be read with common sense. And so I try and, and read her with that way. And it strikes me that an artist has to paint or do performance or act or make poetry with common sense. And that's sort of the, the Arendtian demand that you have to actually try and make things that will be part of the world. They can change the world, but they have to in some way speak to, speak to the world. And we got to train the senses. We have to know what it what it tastes like, what it smells like, what it feels like. If if people if art was training people's senses as it should, then we wouldn't have the, all, all these goddamn environmental problems. People would be paying attention to what they eat, to what they smell, to where they live. And that's I I think that's what we're think we're asking us to think about the fact that our senses, we've lost our senses to go to go to the thinking at times, and we need to stay connected with the senses, and that's what the arts can give us. I mean, I, I, if it doesn't taste good, smell good, feel good, move well, we're going to die. Roger. We're talking about survival. It's Jamie Weissman. Hi, Could Jamie. I jump in real quick on the question of um, catharsis and point us to a passage? Yeah, please. Uh, I would love that. Okay. Uh, page 168 in the middle. Yep. That's where we've been. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just coming back to that. Um, <clears throat> where she says, thought is related to feeling and transforms its mute and inarticulate despondency as exchange transforms the naked greed of desire and usage transforms the desperate longing of needs. To they all, until they are all fit to enter the world and to be transformed into things to become re reified. In each instance, a human capacity, but which by its very nature is world open and communicative, transcends and releases into the world a passionate intensity from its imprisonment within the self. So I, I think I'm hearing the that catharsis, the, the conjoining of thought and feeling there, and the idea um, I don't know. I, I think you would probably be better at parsing it than I would, or maybe somebody else would, but yeah. the idea of art making that catharsis experience durable, making an object of the catharsis experience, if that makes yeah. sense. Can I say something? It, it's Vivian Roger. Can I say something here? On um, yeah, well, I like, I'd like to try and parse that line, but if you want to contribute to that, that'd be great. Or you want to yeah. wait? Okay. I, I think that, uh, you know, I think it, it's good that, um, sorry, what's your name that you just, you just spoke? Uh, Was it Jesse? No, who just spoke Jamie. now. Jamie. Jamie, uh, that you, you brought us back, thank God, to the text. And uh, you, 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 you read what she wrote about it. I think that, that, that the catharsis and, uh, you know what? I have a few things to say, so if this isn't a good time to jump in, I'll just wait my turn. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's let's look at the text, which, as you rightly said, I think it was. Good I just think you need to just look and think about the word mediation, the concept of mediation. It's central. It's central to the thought, feeling thing, and the catharsis. And then I wait my turn. Yeah. No. Thank you, Vivian. And and 
it's Jamie, right? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, is anyone reading the text in German here? If, if you are, Dina, are you here? Um, yeah, I'm here. The, the German is quite, is a bit different on page 203. And I yeah, tried. Very different. What? It's quite different. Yes. Quite different. And so I tried when I was gave the, my opening presentation. I tried to translate, free translate this sentence that Jamie just turned us to, and I translated it as thinking transformed the enclosed dumbness of mere feelings until they are fit eignen into the world because they are ready to be directed to objects and to experience their fulfillment and limit in the thingly condition of the world. I don't know if that's a translation that makes sense to you, uh, I, I, um, but I, I took that to be, I think Jamie's right, that thought is related to feeling. It transforms its, and I, and I think the its is feelings, mute, although it could be thinking, uh, it's not clear in either language. It's mute and articulate despondency as exchange transforms the naked goods of desire and usage until they're all fit to enter the world and to be transformed into things to become reified. So thought in some sense um, transforms things so that they can be um, uh, fit into the world and may are ready to be directed to objects and to experience their fulfillment and limit in this thingly condition of the world. And so there is a way in which there's this catharsis maybe between thought and feeling. Um, I don't know if Dina, you want to say something about the German because, I, yeah. I would just I would just go uh, read the next sentence in the German, which yeah. may suggest a counter interpretation to Jamie's point, which is that what really the the the, the um, salvation, so to speak, here uh, is really of of this passionate intensity that is merely a feeling or a drive, uh, and and frees. And, and in that way frees us from the prison of, of mere consciousness. Yeah. So, and then in German it says, eines nur sich selbst fühlenden selbst, which is really, a, a, it frees it of, of, a, of, a, of, a, um, of the imprisonment of only feeling yourself and not being open to the world. Yeah, I mean, what's freeing us from the sort of mere consciousness, right? Um, or mere feeling. And thinking in some way allows feeling to be transcended into the world. Right, we're freed from constant self-referential. Exactly. You know, and I don't know if that's catharsis. I don't know if that's. I don't think that's catharsis. In not at least in the Aristotelian sense of working through uh, the work of the soul. Um, I mean, if the working through of the soul in Aristotle may actually point towards an opening up to the world. And in that sense, uh, that's what she's speaking of here. Um, away from the self-referential, inward looking, um, um, isolation really, and opening yourself up to the world. Yeah. Is that not what catharsis is? I think yes, it's- I, I mean, I, I'm arguing that that is what catharsis oh, yeah. is. And, I, I think and it's if really that is true, then that's what she's saying here. Right. And it's in interesting the comparison she makes the transmutation of greed into is greed the German word or I don't know what that would be the the greed? naked greed of desire oh yeah the nackte gear it's exactly the same yeah. I think that, that's an in, just such an interesting uh, comparison well, I, making and the making that of goes back to is a transmutation of greed and the making of art is a transmutation of repressed feeling or imprisoned feeling. I don't think it's a repressed feeling, but it's of it's it's somehow thinking allows feelings to be prepared to become reified or verdinglicht, made into a thing. I, I think it might be a good place to differentiate this uh, between verdinglicht, so to make into a thing and vergegenständlichen, so to um, make it to an object. And she has this weird, as, as Roger pointed out, probably uh, Heideggerian influenced phrase of vergegenständlichende Verdinglichung, which trust me, even German is a mouthful um, and is very hard to, to, to translate. But the idea is that what's 
important, I think, is that it, there's a, both an element of ob object and thing. And I think that what we need to keep in mind is the, the, the art is reification, I think we've discussed to, at some length now, and um, including with, with, I think, uh, Phil's apt criticism. But there is this other element, which is that of making into an object. And that includes, um, and I'm basing this on page 137 of the human condition, um, a notion of withstanding, a standing against. I would go as far as saying a resistance. Um, and it's a resistance of standing against in terms of biological life, of death even, but also of this voracious destructive force in consumption, which I think she thinks is, um, you know, um, the cause for, um, you know, catastrophic or can be the cause of catastrophic political consequences. Right. And, and this goes back to the original point I was making in my answer to Bill's first question, that the turn towards free art, free verse, performance art has a lot of positives, but the, the loss for Arendt is the loss of the standing against, the loss of a world that can resist consumption and constant motion and provide a home. Robert, I saw you were trying to intervene. I'll give you the last point on this, and then we're going to move on to some other things, but this has been a great conversation. So, I just, I just thought I would um, remind people of the scene in the Winter's Tale where the statue of the dead queen comes to life. Robert, Robert, turn the of, um, up. Robert, 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 the audience. Robert, can you turn your camera off and maybe we'll get a better, we can't hear you very well. Uh, yeah. Is that better? Can we hear you now? Okay. Okay, better. Let's try it. Um, I, I was simply, I was simply going to suggest as an example, the moment in the winter's tale, where as an example of catharsis, the moment in the winter's tale where the statue of the dead queen comes to life. I don't know if that contributes anything. But... Um. I'd have to, I, I have to admit, I don't have it in my head right away. So I'm going to pass on that, but thank you. Um, let's go back to the questions. And um, I, this was a great conversation. So thank you all. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, Steven, you're next. Thanks, Roger. It was indeed a, a great conversation. Um, if the work of art is essential to human flourishing, it gives life meaning, as you say, the work of art often ends up in the marketplace too. So what happens there? If uh, uh, the art is not accessible to most people and is hived off into a private collection, then it, that's removing it from the world in a sense and depriving people of the benefit of it. Would Arendt see that as a moral failing or just something that we have to put up with if we believe in a market? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a, a, a question that's huge. And uh, um, yeah. so uh, she talks a little bit about this in her essay on the crisis in culture. Um, but I mean, the proper place for an artwork is one that philosophers and thinkers and artists have been debating for generations, right? Um, you know, if artwork is supposed to be meaningful publicly, putting them in private collections seems an abomination. <laughs> um, and yet, so where do you put them? Uh, you put them in a museum, okay. And a museum originally was the place where you came to see what the muses produced. But of course, that's not what a museum is today where thousands of people push you and shove you and, and you, you know, pay your ticket so that you can say I've become educated and therefore, you know, you feel good about yourself. Um, you know, so, you know, where does art go? Um, you know, Bill mentioned before the hierarchy of art architecture, right? It stands out there or public sculpture, um, you know, and, and yet that's only meaningful insofar as 
the temple is still a temple that people believe in. After that, it becomes a tourist attraction. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I think this is a, this is an age old problem of, you know, it, you know, if art is supposed to be this publicly meaningful activity, where do you produce show and, and, uh, hold on to art. And, um, I don't know if there's, uh, a good answer to that. Um, uh, um, you know, I think that in some way, what you need is uh, um, a public appreciation and engagement with arts and the arts. I mean, what James was talking about before that, that the arts is not just about things that people produce and then put in museums, but that we talk about them and engage them and tell stories about them and they become meaningful for us. And, you know, I mean, the fact that the leading newspaper in this country, you know, spends more time on, well, YouTube than, than, than museums. I mean, you know, that's where we're at. Um, now, maybe YouTube is where art is today. I mean, that's, that's sort of, you know, I think that would be the argument. That's where the force of it is. No, what you mean, what you make of that, I don't know. Um, uh, but, um, I don't have a good answer to that, except to say, I think it's a problem and it's a good question. I would just say, Roger, I know a little bit more about music than other art forms. And I'm always gratified to see, uh, on YouTube, uh, organizations like the Netherlands Bach Society putting all, all of its current work and I guess past work up apparently free of charge there must be money exchanged somewhere in the process no, they may not be i mean i mean this is another issue right i mean my students won't pay for anything anymore right they everything they get is free and uh you know there is a question of how artists you know what the fun you know how we fund arts um uh but uh that's that's a bigger question that i'm not gonna engage in in now um but I mean, I can't get them to buy books. They all want to download free PDFs. I mean, which I'm not supposed to know about. But uh, you know, it's it's a it's the 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 complete evisceration of um, any kind of remunerative model for creative production is is I think nigh. <laughs> um, and where that goes, I don't know. You know, I wonder if you allow me to personify. Uh... The, the, you remember the paintings that were stolen from the Isabel Garner, was it uh, uh, Vermeer and Rembrandt? Mm -hmm. They've been out of sight now for a long time. Is it, have they stopped speaking? And does that sound like some, so, so much sophistry if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it doesn't fall? I, 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 art is this weird thing. Art is, it is, uh, I'm thinking of, of, of Rothko. Is it true that Rothko said, oh, I want to make an art that even if you encountered it in the jungle, you would know it was art. <laughs> what was he talking about? What, what did he mean by that? Uh, uh, can, so, can, can I, I know what he meant by it. Please. I know what Rothko meant by it. A man who was a traumatized Eastern European Jew who then slit his wrists and died. Yes. He was talking about the, well, first of all, pain and agony the transformative, the wanting to be taken out of this world and all of the anecdotal mm. detritus of it, uh, whether it's representation in, or objectification in a painting, or all of the, the story, the pain, the narrative, the everything, just to be taken out of it, to be purified in a sense. I mean, I could go on, but I won't. Uh, yes, but but what I, I'm just trying to address what the, what I'm sorry the gentleman uh, was speaking to Roger. And David by the way, is, there is David is asking about it, the public nature. Does art have to belong to the world? Um, and I and I sometimes feel like private collections have works that none of us will see or have ever seen, and yet the works are singing. So no, it does not have to belong to the world. No, it doesn't. As some art does, and it it changes with the times. Sometimes. Yeah. Something has lived for a long time in, in privacy and then becomes public or you have a chance for it to interact with, with the world. But again, I have a few things I want to say. I have to wait my turn. <laughs> Thank you, Vivian. Um, when is my turn? Because I don't I, know. I got to look. I'm because just Roger, 
because Roger, you manage something that few people manage. I don't think I'm so easily shocked, but today you've out, I, I'm outraged by what you've said. So Good. just tell me, I'll wait. You're, you're, there's one person before you and then you're up. Uh, Okie dokie. Okie dokie. Um, yeah, I'll and maybe uh, maybe the discussion has also um, passed by a little bit. Um, so uh, Roger, this you can jump. So oh sorry, I thought you said Klaus. I no, apologize. How? No 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 no, I'm available. Yeah no, uh, I have a uh, I kind of have two questions. The first question is, and this is kind of more random. Do you know Rhett have like her own like personal tastes in what she consider? Like, would she consider that a faculty of judgment? In other words, like. People, there are artists in the in the 20th century who, like people everyone knows like sculptors like Gaia Cometti or or did you prefer like Greek style because <laughs> you're so obsessed with the Greeks everywhere else and then the second thing is how can we have this situation where at once a rent seems very critical of kind of this commodified production process and this duplication of things so plurality is removed but at the same time, she also needs art to create a sort of common world. And in creating common world to a certain extent, art would have to address, is it just that art needs to address a mass public kind of like, you mentioned something which I think is quite fascinating to me that over the summer that you're getting together with people to kind of create this, uh, try to look towards creating humanities that look at things from a universal perspective. Is it a situation where the problem is that we're not looking at things from a universal perspective or trying to address a kind of more universal large audience because something can be addressed to the idea of universality will only appeal to a small elite or something can kind of be very uh, either like not either like identitarian or looking at things from kind of this less global view but very popular among the masses. Yeah. Um, yeah, so those two questions go together that, you know, and um, uh, um, the, 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 the project I mentioned, and I don't want to get sidetracked on it per se, but it, it's related, as you're saying, it comes, it was originally uh, inspired by the last two pages of Hannah Arendt's essay, The Crisis in Culture, which are about judgment and friendship and the humanities. And, um, and what she says in a nutshell is that uh, um, one thing she says is that um, I would rather be wrong with Plato and my friends than be right with my enemies. Um, and she talks, takes that as sort of an example of, of judgment and, and the humanities. And, and what she means, I think, and this is, is, is that um, uh, um, the humanities are us telling a story about who we are, um, uh, about who our friends are, and, and, um, and, and what's important to us. Uh, and, and judgment uh, is within that. Uh, tradition, um, and it's an attempt to create a wide sense of judgment because judgment is not supposed to be personal. How it's supposed to be common. I won't use the word universal. I'll use the word common. Um, it isn't always right, but the point is, if we're going to say something is beautiful or good, we actually want everyone to agree with us. They may not, but we want to try. We want to reach out. We want to try and understand their perspectives and bring it in and amend our perspectives and get to the point where there's a common judgment if possible. Um, and so um, for her, the humanities are political because it's in the humanities that we do the work of actually trying to reach out to the entire perspective, to the other perspective, to the world and try and build a common judgment. Um, and insofar as the humanities today has become a bunch of specialized, hyper intellectual, you know, um, tiny little things on this word and that text and whatever, it's completely abandoned that political task of the humanities. And for her, art and the humanities. So, I mean, the crisis in culture is brought into two parts. One is um, uh, art and culture and one is art and politics. And 
the argument is that art is an absolute essential part of politics because in art, we learn and we work on the creation of common judgments, which is the creation of a common world, which is what politics is. So that's her argument in that essay. And, um, and, uh, and so, you know, what I'm... Which essay? I missed the title of the essay. I'm so sorry to interrupt. It's called The Crisis in Culture. But I do have a second thing that's part of that, which is that Arendt also seems very interested in plurality throughout all her works. And is there, there a kind of a... Arendt seems very interested in plurality in all of her works. Yeah. Is there kind of a... Is there a conflict? And I'm not saying... I agree that I think there should be a common standard to a certain extent, but is there a conflict <laughs> between this idea of having a common standard and having this plurality of identities or views or voices that don't try to claim for speak for everyone. There's no, there's not a, there's not a, there's not a problem with that or a conflict because the common standard is not something set from above. It's something that rises up from below, right? I mean, the, what, why are, the reason Arendt's not a metaphysician or the reason she's not like a traditional philosopher is that she doesn't believe it's possible or desirable to impose some standard from the top. The standard is something built through conversation that rises up from the bottom. And so it starts with plurality and it's an attempt to bring everybody to a broad common understanding that can, that can still do justice to the plurality. Um, so that's her fundamental approach to politics. Um, and, that, and art, which is why she turns to Kant's third critique, right? judgment and art is the fundamental political activity because it's through art and judgment that we begin that conversation about what is good and what is beautiful that allows a political world to emerge. Uh, Vivian, you're finally up. You can tell me how I offended you. I'm excited. Okay. I, I just don't know what to start, but the last thing that you said now, uh, yes, uh, everything she says, thinks, does, writes is non-prescriptive. Uh, I uh, there have been uh, there have been some strong prescriptive statements that have been voiced today, and you displayed no outrage at that. The idea that one can legislate what art should be, and we must be doing this, and we must be doing that. In any case, where you shocked me uh, was I had stuff I wanted to say before you shocked me was that it, this just goes against my religion. I, I am not here attending and trying to learn from you how to read Hannah Arendt uh, because, um, because she has anything to do with common sense thinking or common sense language. And I think that that is anathema, but in, if it, if it beyond and has absolutely no place here. So. I, that's one thing. And then the, the, the first thing I'd like to say, though, is that Hannah Arendt is up against so much in this uh, because the language, at least in English, definitely fails her. And I think that um, Bill touched on this when he said, you know, I wish she were alive. If she were alive, I don't even think it's a matter of her uh, changing her mind about her, her substantive thoughts about meaning and art and work and labor and things like that. I just think that the language and the, um, the, 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 the language that we use to speak about these things has revolutionized so much since, since she, she wrote it. Not only that, but I think that she, so, so anyway, so since I'm not a trained thinker, and uh, since my own work even as a visual artist is, is uh, largely a, a addressing issues of, I think what sometimes can be called uh, de-skilledness or whatever, um, I, I wouldn't even presume to criticize Hannah Arendt because I feel that it, uh, that what she's that that she because she's a brilliant thinker and a brilliant woman who has something to say, and and so it, it's a matter of trying to understand what it is she's saying, and we just can't 
take it on its surface. And here's a woman who, who speaks about, who's not part, um, when she wrote this of the 1950s of the con contemporary art world, she speaks of process. I mean, process is something that revolutionized art you know, in the, in, the late, in the late 50s, the idea about it. And I also think that the whole thought feeling thing is misread or mistalked about here. I think that um, even uh, well, if you think about, and, and Roger, you did say something really good about, uh, you know, when you explained, she says, you know, you can't feel someone's pain, reminded me of in Buddhism, there is also a very difficult to understand a distinction between empathy and compassion. And this is absolutely a parallel to what she's saying. And in terms of her um, uh, um, uh, uh, abjuration or whatever the word is of, uh, let's say, um, expressionism as a style in painting or perhaps in other things, she, she, she is, that is because mediation is, is, is the central part in it for her in 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 thought processes and in, in, in any case the truth is that there might be an aspiration but there can be no uh, uh completely unmediated expression i mean maybe that's unfortunate we're just not able to completely express ourselves in a sort of virgin uh unmediated state even if we're uneducated or even if we we are like the wild child or you know kasper hauser or anything like that. And when I say she's up against uh, language, it's, it's not just language and words, it's bigger than that. It's that who, who is reading her, who she's talking to, um, uh, um, uh, uh, what, used, what used to be called frame of reference, for example. And, and take, take one other example, and then I'll stop talking because I see someone says they're having a problem following my train of thought. Uh, think of uh, somebody, uh, um, uh, who I think was a, a crazy genius, and that's someone like Hans-Jürgen Sieberberg, which I'm sure that most people here don't know, because even young Germans don't know who he was. Here was someone who, who, who worked as an, as an artist, as a filmmaker and everything, in such an extraordinary way, but, but he, 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 and where he sort of pulled apart uh, German culture, and there's just nobody uh, to, to, that speaks his language anymore. It isn't even about agreeing or disagreeing with him. It's about accessing him. Nobody even knows him. So, so um, anyway, uh, yeah. And about Joseph Boyce, for example, an artist I know something about, uh, one of the most influential uh, mid 20th century artists who, who, who ever lived. I mean, there is, I mean, yes, he's associated with thought. He even had his university, which was thought and ideas and things, but he was not even so uh, what later came to be or what was even then called a conceptual artist because he was so bonded to his objects, to the form, to his aesthetic, to that, you know, whether he, you know, installing uh, uh, Volkswagen uh, minivans or wardrobes or animals or whatever, and, um, and a very canny stylist who, in my view, sort of invented what I call this whole sort of Holocaust aesthetic. In any case, th that's it. Have I made any sense to you, Roger? Very much. Um, I thought the comment on boys at the end was excellent. Um... Uh, and I really appreciate that. Um, I think the idea of him being bonded to objects is, 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 is really a helpful way of, of thinking about it. I don't know Hans Sieberberg. I'm one of the many people who don't. Hans Jürgen, Hans Jürgen Sieberberg. Uh, 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 he made a, 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 a fantastic film called um, Hitler. Uh, Ein Film aus Deutschland. Uh, brilliant. And he did a lot of, uh, you know, Wagnerian uh, things you know you pass the file and they're like, fantastic okay the, the, I'll, I'll um you know I'll, and there's a lot in what you said i'm gonna focus mostly on you know just on 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 your on your uh um offense taken at my use of common yes, sense my outrage thank uh, you your thank outrage you. thank um, you um there's a wonderful <laughs> chapter right in um in, in life of the minds, if I'm not mistaken. 
uh, which is called the outrage of common sense, right? Where, where is it? I'm like, do I have it wrong? Um, anyway. Uh, that sounds good to me. Sounds very uh, good. The, warf the warfare between thought and common sense, the intramural warfare between thought and common sense. One of the, we, for those of you who were with us when we read The Life of the Mind, uh, we spent a fair bit of time on, on this question of common sense. Um, I mean, Arendt writes about common sense in, in, in almost all of her books. Um, uh, you know, so I, w let me just say that for Arendt, um, when she, there, she, she distinguishes what she means by common sense from what I think you took me to mean by common sense, um, which would mean sort of what is common uh, and, and sort of vulgar and what everyone holds. Um, uh, that's not what she means by it. And that's not how I was trying to use it. Um, what, what she means by, by common sense is, is a sense, is the, is, the, is the belief that our senses and that the senses and that our feelings and our thoughts can actually um, be built up into a common, uh, a common world and that there is something that holds them together. Um, and uh, common sense is what she calls the sixth sense that fits all of our senses together. Um, and uh, um, and, it, and, it, it, and it, 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 is, it allows us to sort of see the world as making sense in some way. Um, uh, you know, I, I will say that her use of the word common sense is at times quite confusing and, 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 and um, at times I think maybe even doesn't make all too much sense. Um, but, but she is trying to use it um, in, in, in sort of this way of that there is something that binds our different senses together into a whole and that there is, and that it's not vulgar or everyone known. It actually has to be, um, it has to be thought and made. And in fact, it is artists, right? Um, who um, by working on objects and putting them out in the world so that we all respond to them, uh, that in many ways help train and make our common sense. Um, so I, common sense- Okay, is so not it's obvious that your explanation here is, um is actually the opposite of what I meant by common sense. So I think that it, it needs to be defined because I think most people take it as uh, vulgar only in the sense of not a value judgment, but in terms of ordinary quotidian language, that's the point, yeah. that's the point. And I think that, you know, well, you keep on saying she's not a, a meta, uh, she's not a philosopher, she's not, uh, you know, metaphysical, but of course, but she is all the same. And besides which that's her background. And, 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 and so uh, the language of thought is not everyday language. And that's all I meant. The language of thought is not everyday language. Um, and Arendt is not what we would call a, a common language philosopher in that she thinks that everything just means what we think it means. But um, I, I do believe she tries to write uh, whether she succeeds or not or not. She tries to write in ways that are um, widely comprehensible. Um, uh, and um, while she insists that we think deeply about what words mean and their history and their, their resonance and, and their etymology, so she's not just talking about you know everyday usage. Um, she, she wants to write, she wants to make people aware and understand that so that it's not some sort of esoteric jargony um I idea uh but um yeah i hope that makes it less offensive <laughs> i hope but uh sometimes you have to offend no, uh, I, I, yeah, no, it does i just want to say something uh, just uh one more thing about in defense of hannah arendt uh, because she's so, uh, well, she, because she was, first of all, completely, utterly crucified here in New York 
by the Jewish community and because people judge her very, very harshly. But I think that reading her and again, and I probably said this before, and by the way, the very first time we ever had a conversation, Roger, I said that, you know, that she sounds hokey on the art question. That's just the whole language thing and how she's read and how those things are understood now. But in, but, it, but, it, but the way I can't, I can't ever forget who she is and where she was coming from. And just like Mark Rothko wanted to, uh, there's definitely an emotional component in wanting to escape that excruciating, uh, annihilating narrative, and 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 so so she has this more objectified style, let's say, uh, where where you know, but it's not as if she you know she talks about friendship all the time. So for God's sake, I mean she has a huge heart, so she's full of emotion. Actually, it's just not out there style wise. That's, I think that's all right and fair. Thank you, Vivian. I appreciate it. And thanks for the clarification about common sense, which is good. Susan, are you, are you, I know you spoke before. Is this, is this still, your hand still up for a reason? Um, I think we should save it to the end. It's just an interesting thing that I read about a recent $55 million Picasso painting, but you know, it has to do with, you know, the whole overlay of capitalism on art. And so there's a lot of other people before me. So maybe we'll just, maybe, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to lead the conversation astray into something, Roger. Okay. I'll leave it to you. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> RN does talk a little bit about, you know, the way people use art for, social prestige in that essay crisis and culture which we've mentioned a couple times today yeah that's what it um, reminded me of but yeah no no go ahead get get to everyone else it's a, right. a closing comment if you got time all right alex s uh thanks roger uh hi everybody um my question i think is connected with things that have already been mentioned um i guess what i'm wondering about is the uh kind of exchange between uh, Hannah Arendt's type of thinking, and then um, I guess the type of thinking we can call postmodern. And I think a lot of the discussion today, especially, is kind of revolving around those themes. Um, I think Hal was bringing up something along those lines, and uh, also uh, towards the beginning of the meeting. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the way I, I guess I guess what I'm wondering is. Uh, you know, there is this phrase that some postmodernists use, like I've, I've read it in, uh, in Gilles Deleuze, for example, where he basically aff affirms what he calls the death of the world, right? Or he affirms a kind of death of common sense. And, you know, a lot of this uh, way of speaking is very hyperbolic. Um, but, you know, that strikes me as really a kind of a point of difference between the postmodern way of thinking and then Hannah, what Hannah Arendt is trying to do. Um, and I guess another way of putting it may be that, you know, out of those two conditions of plurality, um, the, the, uh, the unity and then the, um, the distinction, postmodernity seems to just take the distinction and want to leave the unity behind. Um, you know, the unity of a common world of, you know, these things that we've been talking about. And I guess my question is, what is the Arendtian response to that? You know, if somebody uh, likes what Hannah Arendt is saying, um, you know, how can they respond to uh, postmodernity? And, and especially, you know, how can that response be more than just a kind of nostalgia, you know, uh, more than just a kind of wistful, you know, yearning for something that's been lost, uh, because you, you tend, I mean, you see that attitude and, you know, somebody like Heidegger, for example, and I'm wondering, you know, how can somebody who, you know, is committed to uh, Hannah Arendt's thinking, how do they move beyond that? Um, so first of all, Alex, bravo, wonderful question. Um, uh, um, and really, in many ways, I think you've already answered it, so I don't have much work to do. Um, uh, you're absolutely right that 
in many so so there's a there's a common beginning point of in some way between Arendt and the kind of postmodern thinking you're talking about, which is that they both reject universal standards and metaphysics and a world that can be um, uh, you know uh, subsumed to conceptual um, you know order. Um, the difference is that many of these thinkers that you've mentioned, you know, say, oh, well, it, metaphysics is gone, therefore it's all play, it's all, on, it's all disorder, it's all disunity. Uh, we don't need uh, to worry about, you know, that stuff because it doesn't exist. Um, uh, Arendt uh, does not at all engage in that move. You're absolutely right. And nor does she turn back to a nostalgia for a kind of universalist truth. Um, what she says is, we are stuck. We, 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 we as humans need a world. We need a home. And yet we have to be honest with ourselves that we're living in a time in which that home is increasingly fragile, disordered, undone. And there's no universal, there's no tradition, the break of tradition, it's not gonna come back. And so from her point of view, we need to um, honestly engage in the practice of what it means to build a world. So just to give you one, you know, look, I think a lot of, I think few, too few people have, 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 have understood and embraced the question you've asked about our inverse postmodernism. But to give you one example, I have a, an essay that I think I mentioned recently that was published a few years ago called Protest and Democracy. And in it, I, I, I contrast Arendt to three postmodern political thinkers, uh, Simon Critchley, Jean Ranciere, and David Graeber. I mean, Graeber's not a postmodernist, but okay, but in this case he is. And these are all people who basically say, um, uh, you know, political uh, centralization is done, the state is, is, is over, um, all they're all anarchists, right? So all politics of the state and the center is is violent, Ranciere's view, right? It's, it's the police and, and there's no such thing. And so all we have left and what we have to do is embrace protest as the new way that we live together. And the only way to be free is to constantly protest against whatever order exists. And they all develop a kind of existentialist political thinking around the necessity of constant protest. You know, against this, Arendt would agree with them that the nation state is, 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 is a problematic institution. It maybe needs to go away in some way, that uh, the, the central order is, 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 is not something we can just restore. But she believes that you need to, from the ground up, build, um, uh, upon the plurality, um, you need to build agreements, common sense, understandings, uh, you know, judgments, institutions, because you can't live without them and you can't have meaningful freedom without some stability and without some institutional um, protections for liberty and, and freedom and, and things of that sort. Um, and so, you know, uh, you know, in this essay, I, 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 did, I think, in some ways, what you're doing on the question of politics, which is sort of uh, try to give an Arendtian answer to what I consider to be um, a postmodern mm -hmm. politics, a protest. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think you could do this in, in many other uh, realms as well. Um, and, uh, and I think it would be a, a useful uh, uh, endeavor. Um, so, um, I think that's an answer to your question, but I think you are your your question was good enough that it almost answered itself. So thank you. Is that clear, um, Alex, or is that helpful? Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense to me. Uh, I guess I guess what you're saying is, um, you know, the way to uh, not slip into some kind of nostalgia is to basically engage in a kind of politics of the common world. Yeah, and uh, because I guess that world needs defending not just from 
totalitarianism, but also from anarchism on the other side, as it were. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yes. And in her, you know, another place where you can look for this is in her essay on, on education, uh, crisis in education. Um, also in that volume between past and future, um, uh, in which she says that, you know, the world has lost its authority. Um, and we can't just return it. We can't just, you know, magically say, Oh, I'm a teacher. I'm going to tell you what's true. I'm going to tell you what, but we need, to understand that a teacher has to teach both rebellion against the world, but also has to teach the world because you can't just rebel against the world. You also need a world to live in. And if all teachers only teach rebellion, she says, then there will be no, there'll be nothing to rebel against a and B there'll be no world to live in. Um, and so the, the hard part about a teacher today is that it's so easy to teach rebellion What's hard is to try and teach something that is and something meaningful about the world we have that can be held on to and that people can then rebel against, but at least understand that they live in that world. And that's why she says education has to be both conservative and revolutionary. You have to teach people the world that they live in so that they love it and know it and respect it and teach them to be revolutionaries who will change and disrupt that world but you can't just do one and roger i can't resist once again i'm going to say you have to teach them that there is a lie at the heart of the world and that lie is that there has never been a common world and that 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 is per something perpetrated by as you know my baby bugaboo the whole western tradition of which i believe miss uh, hannah arendt is really not able to look around there has never been a common world. It is a lie. Now teach children how to make a world. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, on one level, I think clearly there's never been a common world. And yet, on the other hand, there have been times in which a kind of common world has formed, which, of course, always excluded people. Um, uh, wherever it was, whether it was in Rome or Greece or, or in the United States or wherever, um, without a doubt. Uh, and so when, when, when she says, teach them that there's a, a world, she says, teach them the world. And part of the teaching of the world is that the world was never a common world. And yet it insisted that it was a common world. That's what she says to teach them. And that's also to teach them to be revolutionaries, to constantly push it. But you can't just do one or the other. Part of teaching them the common world is that the world is never finished because the common world, we've never had a common world. It's, it's never finished. And that's, that's what she says you teach them when you teach them you're teaching a common world. But, you know, I, I think, I, I hope that makes sense. Um, I think that's what's so interesting about her, her educational thinking is that I think it's deeply, um, it incorporates in the idea of a common world change and revolution and, and lack of, of lack of, Fixity, lack, lack, so lack of success in its commonality. Um, Clara, I think this is the last question, and then maybe we can come back to Susan if we have time. We have five minutes. We'll see. Okay. Uh, thanks, Professor Roger. Uh, it has been certainly a great session. And at this point, I just want to add something, and is that um, I think it's really important to bring into the discussion the Arendtian phenomenological approach to the world. Mm. The world is always given to us in perspectives, never as a totality, except in the case of, of God, I would say. That's why art and politics are crucial at finding a sense, especially to our existence and to our experience of sharing a world that, as you say, is never finished, is never conclusive. Wonder, yeah, I mean, absolutely. The I mean, I, I, you know, I have a tendency to not use philosophical terms when I talk about Arendt, and that's my own bugaboos, but you're absolutely right. What we've been describing and talking about is a phenomenological perspective. Um, I just never know what a phenomenological perspective is, so I, you know, you know, I'm not a philosopher. Um, 
Uh, but, but yes, I think this is what, um, this is the phenomenological perspective that she's talking about. And I think it's an, an absolutely essential recognition of her method and, and approach. And so um, you're right. Thank you. Thanks to you. We got three minutes. Susan, you want to tell us about a $55 million painting? Oh, I just, yeah, very quickly. And then I have a, a quick question that came from what was just said. But um, the, the joke was, a little bit of a joke maybe, is that this, this painting that sold for $55 million with a, was a Picasso painting. The joke is, is that when it was put up for sale at Christie's, I think it was Christie's, yeah. When it was put up for sale at Christie's and the, they brought the painting out or showed the, you know, they showed the picture on the screen, is that everyone just looked at it. Silence in the room. And the auction began and blah, 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 blah. And at $55 million, when it finally sold, there was all this clapping. And the joke is, why didn't they clap for the painting? They clapped for the fact that it was sold for $55 million. It was a comedian who brought that forward. I saw that a little clip and I thought, absolutely right. And if you watch those auctions on this, this phenomenal art, you know, it's true. They never clap. I've seen the clip. They never clap when the art is brought out. They clap for the fact that it was sold for $55 million. Okay, that just kind of blew me away. Now, that was my, that's just my little thing to make people think about that for a moment in terms of the overlay of capitalism and commodification of artworks. But okay, but beyond that, and you don't probably have time for this now, but this will come up again. What was just, what, what Clara just said was just, I just occurred to me, which is, so Roger, do you think, so what, what Arendt is saying in terms of a common world, there's a fluidity in that then, yeah? A fluidity? A fluidity. There's yeah. not this common world like Bill was saying, is like, oh, once upon a time, long ago and far away, there was this beautiful place and everyone was like, oh yeah, let's get together and talk about this stuff. I get that it's, it's I mean, I know, I know that, I think all of us know that that never existed. And yet she does continue to, to use this phraseology. And I, I think maybe that's, maybe that's certainly been a problem for me. I won't speak for Bill, but all of a sudden I have, I have realized, which I knew there was never a common world, but yeah, why does she, there's, there's something confusing in there in her thinking. And yet hearing you speak about it just now, yeah. And, and, and hearing your interpretation of what she's saying, yes, there's a fluidity in that. This common world, is that just, that's the experience in which we all live in our little, short little lifespans, I guess. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know now, I gotta think about that more. It's, it's, really, it's really interesting, Susan, because, you know, she talks about the break of tradition, right? And so at some points, the common world is more ossified. And there's a group of people who think there is a common world. There's always exclusions, but there is, you know, and what she says is, you know, today I'm writing at a time in which the common world, the, bro the tradition has completely broken. And a lot of people think that's a bad thing. And there are negatives and she points out the negatives, but she also says it's also beautiful because it's at a time when we can, we're free to rethink and rebuild the common world. And when, when we live at times when there's real consensus and lack of fluidity, most of us don't have any freedom to rebuild the common world and we're stuck. And if we're excluded from it, we're stuck. And so she says at the end of the, end of the essay, what is freedom, you know, I mean, what is authority? She goes, look, the loss of authority is not a bad thing. It's actually a pretty good thing because it, allows us to be free and, and engage in this process. At some point, we may reconstitute another tradition and we lose that freedom for a while because we'll largely have a new tradition emerge and then it'll fall apart and then another one will emerge. Um, and at each time when, it's, when we have too much tradition, we should remind ourselves that we're excluding people. And when we have not enough tradition, we should remind ourselves it's also important to have some sort of common world. And, you know, I think as she's saying, you need both. And uh, I think that's a, an important point of hers, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. 
Listen, this has been great. Um, great discussion today, folks. Um, great. great. Uh, we, we, we're done with the work chapter. Uh, we're on to the two last chapters of the book, Action, which is probably the most talked about of all the chapters in, in the book. And then the one that I think is the most important, the Vida Activa in the Modern Age. Um, but we will um, continue on with action for next Friday. Uh, thank you all and enjoy reading Hannah Arendt. We'll see you next week.